Hello. Hey, Evan. Hey, everyone. Hey, Erlemi. How's it going? Doing well, doing well. How are you? Good. Your first time on the stream? It's my first time. Is it your first time on any stream? Uh, it actually, it is. I think I've, I've shown up on some game streams here and there uh, as a, uh, a participant, but uh, never the one on camera. So Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I know you're a gamer. We've been, we've been gaming lately, so I, I would have expected you to be a strong Twitch streamer, but uh, yeah. I, guess, I guess no. <laughs> Not so much, just kind of a, a, a Warzone newbie. <laughs> and, uh, trying to convert you into one as well, get you away from Apex. Um, okay, so you're Evan, but what what do you do, Evan? Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I uh, am Evan Lindsay. Uh, I'm working at, with you at Postman. <laughs> um, so at Postman, uh, my title is actually now a uh, senior estet. So what that means is software development engineer and test. So I work with the engineering groups uh, on a particular squad. Uh, and with that, uh, we focus on uh, developing code, but the code that we're trying to develop uh, is focused on the quality assurance of a particular area of Postman. Uh, so in doing so, um, you know, we have to know the product very well, right? So basically we're, we're quality assurance and that we're testing the product, but we're also creating, uh, you know, automated uh, in very, uh, well thought out solutions uh, to doing the testing. Um, been with the company for about, uh, I guess this is almost month three that I've been with them. Uh, so still kind of new uh, and still getting to know everybody. So getting yeah. to know you and here we are. <laughs> I think the that's the, as the company is growing so fast, I struggle to know everyone. There's like 10 new joiners every week and it's always like, oh, you're new. And then you used to develop on calls with like people you don't know. And it, it, it's, a, it's a constant discovery. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm Arlemi. Uh, you may know me already, but I know some new faces. There's Test Explorer in the chat. Hello. I, I don't think I've seen you before, but uh, I'm a developer advocate at Postman as well. Uh, I live in London, and basically what I do is we hear feedback from uh, users. Something may not be working, and then I go to Evan and say, "Please fix this," and then Evan takes it and does his magic, and then fixes it with the engineering team, and there there we go. Um, what are we going to do today? So we've we've uh, labeled that uh, that stream as building and playing an API driven game. Uh, so what we'll first do, uh, we'll go through uh, there's a GitHub repo that Evan created, which shows like how that game works and how you can like play it from from your end. And I'll go through that and show you how you can do it. And then uh, Evan will show us, us like how he created it, uh, the code behind it, and how you could like, basically do the same. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good on this. And just kind of, uh, I guess, a little background how this came to be, too, uh, why this even exists, I think, uh, is kind of a neat uh, little tidbit about the company. So basically, every other week at the company, we have uh, the, the Thursday demos, right? So that gives uh, an opportunity for, uh, you know, the business side of things to kind of give an update about, you know, where we're at, how things are coming, uh, new updates to the product. Uh, but also when we're new to the company, uh, we're expected to give some sort of demo, just sort of showcasing our usage of the product. So uh, you'll see what came to life, but that's basically why this exists. And uh, just thought that would give a good background as to uh, what it is. Yeah, you're just giving off secrets, saying we have product demos, etc. during the week. <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to know. <laughs> okay, so before we start, uh, as we always do, uh, we'll do In Case You Missed It. So what is In Case You Missed It? Let me move Skype away. In Case You Missed It is just me going quickly through what's been released in the last Postman, uh, in the last Postman release. Uh, so 7.33 was released this week and two new features came with it. So as always, if you want to read about it, you can either look at the change log on our website, like the full release notes, uh, or you can go on our community forum and there's like user-friendly release notes, as we call them, which just walk you through the, the main new features. Uh, so two things. Um, we have the API builder where you can import, create, design your APIs, and like generate API elements. Um, if you're doing that in a collaboration uh, setting, you may want to be notified with like by email or in-app when someone changes something. So now you have that feature, a bit like the watch on GitHub, when you can watch a repository for changes. Um, so you can click on watch. Uh, 
you're watching it and then from from there on you'll be getting notifications whenever someone like updates the schema uh, adds a comment or something like that the other one talking about github is you can now bulk import a specification from github so there's a there's a nice neat worth flow that you can go through lists all your repositories uh, scans for specification files and then you can select which ones you want to import and whether you want to generate collections from it and that's it so easier than like downloading them locally importing them or importing through a link and also like scans the whole thing so uh, hopefully it makes your life easier so that's it for the for the news it's short uh, hopefully sweet hopefully you like that and hopefully you're going to use it but let's get into uh, the actual content hey john john's work alias okay so that's hello john um let's go ahead and look for the repository so i'm looking for even let's see so i'm gonna paste that on the chat so you can you may want to follow along uh you may just want to watch watch what i'm doing uh, but that's the repository that uh, you've put together that goes through what the app is and how i can play it right yeah yeah it should have a link to uh, the actual built version of the game which runs on webgl so it's hosted through github uh, the service itself is out of a separate repo but i don't think we're going to go into as much detail on the service itself it's more or less just a relay layer that we can send the messages from postman to the game but uh yeah, the, uh, the repo itself um, should outline what's necessary for you to be able to uh, open the game in your browser and then start calling it from Postman. Okay, let's see. Let's see if you've done a good job. We, we, <laughs> we, love, we love going through, Dude. like... <laughs> the, the documentation test. Yeah. So first link, I click on it. What do I see? Okay, I do see uh, a Unity 3D. So you, you've been using Unity, you were saying, and that's the game. Um, so it's in a waiting connection. So I'm guessing I need to, or, or this is like creating a connection with the backend. Yeah, exactly. So okay. the way it's hosted is the service lives on Heroku. Um, if you're familiar with Heroku, uh, they're actually a great service if you just need a very uh, simple uh, free service uh, that can live on the cloud. Uh, that said, if you actually intend on a lot of people using it, you need to pay for it. Uh, but if you're using the free layer, or the free tier, uh, it sleeps when you're not using it. So the first person to connect to it in a given day, it might take them a minute to wake it up. So that's what's going on. Okay, so we've got we've got a link now. I'm gonna go back to this. So you would expect, right, from a game that clicking on my arrows would move the thing around, but no, 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 we're not. We're an API focused company. We like playing with APIs. So I'm gonna go and follow the instructions. So get Postman. Um, luckily enough, I already have it, and it's running actually here. You can see, I've got the collection runner. I'm gonna close, and I've got the app. Uh, I can get the collection of API calls. Um, so that's a link to the JSON. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna copy the link and import from a link like this. Format not recognized. No way. Let me first switch to. Uh, the right so it does not recognize the format I'm going to try something else I'm going to save it first on Twitch cool I'm going to try to import this way I'm going to go to Twitch have you had that issue before where it did not recognize the format of the collection yeah Um, not personally Mm -hmm. uh, I actually haven't imported this collection because I was the one exporting it, so maybe I should have tried both ways. <laughs> well, it says format not, not recognized for some reason. Uh, let me quickly see if I can have a look. I'm going to open the file on the side. And if not, we'll just switch to uh, your laptop because I think you have it already open. Well, so actually, I'm trying to import an HTML file instead of JSON. So that's the that's the file that I'm getting from your... Uh... Oh, okay. Okay, so it's not an issue with Postman. Uh, no, that's, pro uh, yeah. that's probably yeah, just let's... because I'm doing save as... Yeah, so I should actually... That's that's GitHub, right? That's Even though it finishes right. by JSON, 
is still an HTML page of the of of the file. So I need to open, go here, and now I can import. Uh, yeah, we want to we want to download the raw file. So after uh, under instructions, if you uh, click on the collection of API calls is available link. Yeah, so that's going to bring you to uh, the file in the repo. Uh, but what you'll want to do is click on raw, and then you'll want to download that file yeah. uh, as a raw JSON oh. file, and that should fix it for you. So now I just realize you're watching me on Twitch, so you have a delay. Let me share my screen on Skype so you can actually see. As because I like what you just described, I had already done it while you were talking about it. So now you can oh, see really? real time. Yeah. So I've... I'm not actually watching you at all. I'm just speaking <laughs> in theory. I've got you on Skype. <laughs> okay. So now you can see I'm on my Postman, uh, and I've imported the collection, which is called Postman notes. So I'm gonna scroll down and find it here, and I have my collection with the different calls. So that's the different calls that I can do. Uh, so turn forward, turn back, turn left, and I can make the make the character move. I'm gonna go in the two side window, and we'll go back to the repository and walk through. So I've got the API calls in my Postman. It's imported. I need to go back to the game, get the endpoint. So I get this, and I should have. So do I need to change the collection variable? No, I need to change it at the collection level, the uh, request level. So let's yeah, do so work. The easiest thing to do would be to set environment variables. So what we can do is create an environment. Uh, so endpoint is already gonna be set as the variable that you're using in each of these calls. So what you'll wanna do is create an environment and then we can just add these two variables to okay. the environment. Let's do new great postman at endpoint is going to be this and then yep. we have one that is username yeah username it's going to be oh, let me okay and i'm going to select that environment and it picks it up so that's nice uh, let me quickly see Hey, Danny. And okay, so yeah, someone on chat had the same issue with the import, but they fixed it by clicking on the link and then doing row and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so what I can do is I can fix that in the doc that it just takes you to the raw file as opposed to the file, uh, the file path in GitHub. So we caught an error in the docs, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> So now it says send your actions and that's it. So let's go ahead. So I've got my postman note here and I'll tell him to walk. It's walking. Look at him go. I'm so proud. <laughs> yeah. And you can see over there that you called the, uh, well, the user is you. Uh, yeah. The performance was walk, but there's no direction assigned. So for certain calls, you may just be calling an action. For certain calls, you may be calling a direction, and for certain calls, you may be calling both. So if I, if I walk back, is it going to start moonwalking towards me, or is it going to turn around and... I I can't even remember. Let's find out. Ah, okay. It's doing a there you go. proper 180. You get, to, you get to see that sweet Postman logo. <laughs> yeah, I, I must say I appreciate the, the time you spend designing this. Some, some well-designed well -designed game. Well, as far as all the assets, the 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 postman itself, uh, the astronaut, that's something I got free off the Unity Asset Store. Um, same with the background, uh, and the uh, the landscape itself is actually a 3D model taken off the NASA website that I blew up to about eight thousand percent so that he could walk on it. So I'm definitely not an artist or a, an animator by any means, but I am capable of pinning a postman logo to uh, someone else's. Uh, assets so. that works that works pretty well so i don't know yeah. if anyone noticed i managed to make a flip while can i so how fast can i send these requests so it just only does flips I'm yeah not... you could actually i was playing around with this it, it kind of confuses it but if you wanted to send the whole collection you would see him try and uh do oh. a whole bunch of things at once and then just come to a stop let's let's try that so with the collection runner we can line up a certain amount of calls. 
Uh, if it loads, okay, cool. So I've got my postmatic collection. Uh, I don't want it to ping, I don't want it to be idle. I'll go, um, let's see. If it walk, then it will turn left actually, so we have the right side of it. And then it's going to do a flip to the left. There has to be, yeah, there's a deselect all. Oh, I could have used that, it would have been easier. And let's do that five times with no delay. Okay, let's see. Oh, what's happening? Oh, it doesn't get the environment. Oh, is there a, an environment you need to set in the collection when, runner? Probably, let's see. Yep, <laughs> environment, environment, there we go. There we go. So, all good. I need to space for environment, yep, good point. Yeah, okay. I could spend hours doing that actually. <laughs> Took precedent over the other stuff. <laughs> I think it's just because Let's it's see. already it was already going left. So if I change the turn left to turn right and flip back like this. And then flip left. <laughs> <laughs> That's some strong Capoeira move. Yeah, he's got him. And it looks like he ran into the wall. So uh, in order to keep you to stay, uh, uh, to keep you on that uh, that giant model I was saying I blew up, um, there's some invisible boundaries. So it, at a certain point, if you're walking left, walking right, forward or back, you will eventually run into a boundary. And that's where you're at. That's cool. Yeah, I was expecting, I was somehow expecting you could just keep going and keep going, but yeah, I, there, there is limitation to your space. But then you would just fall off the edge of the model. <laughs> yeah, because it goes into a free fall. It's probably flat, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the game. Uh, let's see if we're missing anything else here. No, so there's a service that we could look into. There's the plugins that you've been using uh, and the asset. So we've played the game, it's cool. Uh, and eventually what we want to do, like probably after you've showed us how it works, we'll just send a link that everyone can use and we can all like kind of fight for like controlling the, the, the character. But for yeah. now, let's switch to your screen and see how you actually get this to work. Um, you probably have to reshare your screen on Skype because I've taken over. Okay. Yeah. I saw that. Let me, uh, figure out how to get it going. Cool. Okay, I'll switch to your screen. Nice. Okay. So uh, a little background into how it's built um, outside of using Postman as the client, right? So we're invoking the commands through Postman. We're sending them to a service. Uh, the service itself is built in uh, C Sharp. It's a uh, ASP.NET Core. Uh, we stayed pretty Microsoft centric in the stack because uh, Unity itself uh, is built on Microsoft technologies and uses C Sharp as its primary language. So uh, to keep everything uh, somewhat similar, uh, we've done that and we're using SignalR. So SignalR is a uh, essentially a real-time connection that is created between the game and the service. So while we're able to uh, call the service from Postman uh, to, uh, well, like I said, we call the service from Postman, uh, Postman needs to make sure, or the service needs to make sure uh, that the actions are sent in real time to the game. So that's where that SignalR plugin comes in as a kind of a layer between the two. So S SignalR kind of lives in Heroku and Postman sends to SignalR and SignalR sends to the game? Yeah, more or less. So what Postman is sending is just a post request to a controller. Uh, in the controller itself is an endpoint. So that endpoint that you pasted in the environment variable uh, hits that controller. That controller itself is aware of the SignalR hub and invokes uh, the command 
to the connected client. So the whole reason you paste in that uh, ID is because that's the ID of the client. So the controller sends the command in real time to the client and then Unity or the published game has to pick up on that command and then do something with it. Uh, so that's more or less where we come in here. So inside of Unity or the game itself, we can receive that JSON in real time, but uh, we have to do something with it, right? Because JSON is just JSON. Uh, we're getting uh, more or less just a, an array of, uh, or an object of keys and values. Uh, and then we got to figure out how we can apply that to the game. Yeah. So, so here we are in Unity. And this is just a basic setup, so everything you were just viewing uh, was built in just a basic scene here. Uh, so I was talking about so uh, the tr can you, campaign. Can you quickly say what's yeah. Unity for people that are not like familiar with it? Totally. Yeah, uh, so so Unity 3D, uh, it's, it's just that. It's a, a 3D game development platform. Uh, it's been around for some number of years. I yeah. think I started <laughs> using it on like version 4 back in like 2013. Um, and have you know i've never been a professional game developer i think we should preface that in that this is just kind of this is just kind of fun this is hobby dev uh but a very powerful uh game development uh platform uh that ties together uh really all of the the different facets of game development and that you're able to create scenes import models uh apply characteristics to those models uh and then control it through you know whether it's some built-in functionality in the editor or code itself uh, in this case, we're using code to control pretty much everything. And so you've got the scene in the middle, then the game, I guess, is the real life, like the live view, as if you were playing it, and then your assets right. at the bottom. So if I launch it, we might get an error because I have some stuff commented <laughs> out at the moment, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, okay, it, it starts just fine. So, okay, so you can see over here, this is the live game. So this is what you just played. It's just not a fully built version of it yet because we're going to have to add in the things to make it a fully built version. Uh, but what we've got is at least that. We've got the scene, we've got the postmonot, and we've got the ability to make a connection and display that connection name. So once again, the first part of the endpoint is the address of uh, where the app lives, where the service lives on Heroku. And then the second part is the ID. So the ID is something that was unique when I launched the app uh, that created a unique connection. So if I send actions to that client ID on the service, it knows, okay, that's my client. I'm going to send that. Now, right now, I'm the only person who has a handle on this client ID. But like you said, at the end of it, whether it's running right here in my editor or whether it's running uh, in someone's web, if we share that, anyone who has that client ID can then send commands to it. So it can, be, it can become a free-for-all. So... <laughs> That's what we'll do. <laughs> yeah, we, we should. There should be another stream where you add more characters and you have like different people controlling different characters, but on the same instance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Version uh, two point the true multiplayer. Yeah. <laughs> I think we actually we need to add some objectives because while we say it's a game, it's really just us making a uh, an astronaut dance. You know. It can be a, a very like uh, soothing game. You know, like when you don't have an objective and you just walk around like indefinitely. It has to be some yeah. type of game like this. Spacewalk. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. All right. So I think as far as how we can add in uh, different ways to control it, we could sort of go down the list. But when you were showing your uh, instance of it, uh, you were seeing that there was a user, there was a direction, and there was an action that we were performing. So the logical way is to just kind of walk through each of those and add them in as something that can be performed. Um, I'd say the easiest would be to start with direction. Uh, we'll show the code. We'll kind of walk through the code that would need to be added um, and then kind of do it one at a time. And then mm -hmm. you can just ask me a bunch of questions uh, along the way. I will. And, uh, <laughs> and anyone in the chat as well, like if you have any questions for Evan or for me, so I can ask them to him as well, uh, just go ahead. Great. All right. So we've got six classes. Uh, what you're looking at here. Uh, is just an instance of Visual Studio. Uh, so Visual Studio Community is the preferred editor uh, for Unity. And the language that you're looking at is C-sharp. Uh, so we've definitely got a lot of boilerplate code here. There's just not enough time on the street to, or on this stream to uh, to walk through every bit of it. But uh, there's also a lot of missing pieces, which we're going to start adding in. Um, so for service actions, 
we can see that in the uh, in the game itself, we have a uh, a game object that we've called actions, and we've tied this script to it. On that script, we've uh, designated what the uh, URL of the signal our hub is. So it's that service plus action hub, and then that action hub is going to send its actions to um, a listener called receive action. So as the client, if I have a listener called receive action, um, I can uh, then take the JSON data that's been passed to the service and do something with it. So the script itself, service actions, is over here. And let me pull something up. Okay. So within service actions, what we already have, you saw this. Um, we have references to some different game objects. Uh, for instance, we have endpoint, which references the endpoint bar. Uh, the endpoint bar uh, is what was sitting at the top of the scene. So we have to be able to display that new connection that's been made uh, so that you can copy it and make use of it. Uh, and then outside of that, uh, we just uh, create a new instance of the library that is able to communicate with SignalR. Um, that library, uh, while it's being used by the game, is also a separate repository that's on my GitHub. So if you're super interested in the inner workings of how you can communicate <laughs> through Signal <laughs> within Unity, that's a whole other repo and a whole other stream. So is a uh, quick question. Is like everything works with like game object? Is it any script needs to be attached to a game object and then you can do actions with it? Or can you have like a global script? So has, like, uh, different actions. Yeah, so to, to initialize the script, it needs to be attached to a game object, uh, this script at least, right? So I've got uh, that uh, actions game object, and I've got the script attached to it. So we're actually going to be calling um, the further actions through the start method. So whenever the scene starts, if you have a script attached to a game object, it's going to call the start method. And then the start method just runs top to bottom. Uh, for the different things that you've designated as things that need to occur uh, at the beginning of that scene. So since we're calling things like the initialization of the library and the reference to the endpoint bar in the start method, um, then we'll have those as soon as the scene is launched. Um, endpoint, what's going on there, as you can see on the UI, let's open up Canvas, endpoint bar. So you can see that on the endpoint bar, which is part of my UI canvas, uh, that there is going to be a couple of different things. There's placeholder, there's text, and there should be an input field. So since that lives in the same scene, what I'm saying is to make a reference to that endpoint bar, I'm going to have my game object find something named endpoint bar, case in point, endpoint bar. It's going to find that, and then it's going to get a component from that game object uh, called endpoint bar. So that's actually a reference to a script that's attached to the endpoint bar. So if you scroll down, you can see right here, there's another script. Um, there's the endpoint bar script, which is going to be uh, how I send uh, the connection ID uh, to this game object to then be displayed. And then there's also the uh, plugin, the WebGL copy and paste plugin, which I did not create. There is a link to that in the GitHub repo. Um, but on the web, for some reason, you can't just automatically copy and paste from an input. So uh, there's a guy on GitHub that uh, created a nice little plugin for that, and it works pretty well. So what, what what does it do? Does it just like allow for a right click copy, or is it just you you left click it and it copies automatically? Uh, just standard keyboard shortcuts. Okay. However, you would normally do it. Yeah, if you were if you highlight it, you can. Uh, I don't think you will get any right click action out of it, but you can do Control C, and then get the. Uh, the copy action from it, which that works natively in the editor. It just doesn't work on the web. So there's a plugin. Some decision they made. Yeah. Or like, I forgot uh, to. It has to be some security or just someone somewhere that forgot about that. <laughs> it happens. Um, yeah. Okay. So what we want to do is once we've created that signal our library instance we want to subscribe to two different events we want to know that the connection has started and we want to know that a message has been received uh, so these are methods that are available through the library and when you subscribe to them 
uh, whenever something happens in real time from the service that sends it to this client, they will come through these two uh, subscribers. So the connection started method is going to get called one time whenever the scene is started and I'm going to get my connection event args. Uh, essentially, all my connection event args are is uh, a connection ID because I need to know, okay, I've established a connection with the hub. I have a unique ID, but if I don't get a handle on that, it's useless because then I can't do anything with it. So, so I've got that. I take that connection ID and I send it to the endpoint bar. So we've made that reference to the endpoint bar and we're going to update the URL displayed on the endpoint bar. So I was saying that on the endpoint bar, uh, there was a script attached to it. Well, this is the script that was attached to it. So we'll get the component of the input field, which also lives on the endpoint bar. So we get the component of the input field, and then we're going to make a reference and then change the text of that endpoint field to the URL I just passed to it. So ta-da, that's step one. <laughs> Almost done. <laughs> yeah, a little ways to go. Yeah, the DSL looks very like a WebSocket, -y, right? It's like subscribe to a. It's it's exactly what it is. So yeah. so SignalR is is sort of an abstraction of WebSockets. Okay. Uh, I won't speak too much to it because I'm not a SignalR pro either. Um, but you know that's it. I do have some experience in in writing. Uh, you know different uh, C sharp utilities that do make use of SignalR. Uh, so the idea is just that, that it's sort of an abstraction of raw web sockets that allows you to communicate uh, through Microsoft-centric applications um, in real time. I think it has some fallback capabilities. If it's unable to connect via the web socket, uh, it can make uh, use of other methods uh, to ensure that connection stays live and then can receive information. Uh, but yeah, no, you're right on point. You subscribe to it, and then you basically sit there and listen uh, to be invoked. Case in point, message received. Uh, so with that, so with message received, we're going to get our message event args. And the message event args, um, in this case, sort of like the connection event args or a connection ID, the message event args are a message. And that message, we uh, have created the service to pass as JSON. So it's JSON coming from Postman, it's JSON when it gets to the service, and it's JSON when it gets to the game. So we keep it really simple going across. Um, but we just need to make use of it. We need to do something with it. So uh, I do have a, a class. This is what I would consider um, a plain old C-sharp object. I've called it action command. So I instantiate a new action command, and then using the Unity JSON utility, I can create uh, an actual C-sharp object extracted from the JSON string that was passed in. So we've got our message as a JSON string, from that JSON, we are going to apply uh, the uh, action command uh, to the object itself. So if we look at action command, we can see that nothing's been created yet. I have a serializable, uh, just plain class. So the first step here, since we're going to focus on direction, would be to add um, a direction string. So rather than to do, we can go ahead and create a public so just to be clear, that's not like the code that you're showing right now without the to-dos, uh, like or with the to-dos not done, is not what's actually in production, right? We're just going to rewrite some bits of the app. Exactly, okay. exactly, yeah. <laughs> so so rather than try and think through this in 30 minutes uh, yeah. in front of everybody, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, this is all, this is something that was created a while back and then I updated a little bit yesterday, but yeah, we're essentially just going back through the steps that were used to create it. So we've got the direction, so uh, we'll start with that, so to do direction, okay? So we need to create uh, an instance of the player, we need to get a handle on the player so that we can pass a direction command to the player. So up here you can see I have to do player actions. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a private player control, and we're going to call it player. So player control is a reference uh, to another script that I have that is attached to the Postmanod itself. So player control is basically everything you saw happening. It's 
variables that dictate how quickly it should walk, run, turn, whether there's gravity applied to it, what directions forward, back, left, and right. Um, but right now it's basically that. It's it's basically an outline to what would be necessary to make use of that character, but it's not actually performing anything yet. So we have two public methods. We have set direction and perform action. So set direction is what we're going to target at the moment. So we've got um, a variable type of player, but we need to create a reference to the actual player that's on the scene. So in the same... Uh, with the same idea that we're finding the endpoint and getting the component of endpoint bar, which is a script, uh, we're going to do that with player. So we'll do player equals game object dot find, and it's not lowercase, it's capital game object dot find. Okay, so we're going to find that game object by name from what's in the scene. So within the scene, I have a character called Postmanon. So Postmanot is the game object I'm going to look to find, and then player controls the script attached to that Postmanot that I'm going to make reference to. So we'll find Postmanot, and we'll get the component, and we will make the component player control. And boom, so we have a reference to the player. So much like we can pass data to the endpoint that can be displayed, we can pass data to the player to do something. Uh, so at this point, with that reference, if we go down to where I want to apply the direction, we can see that there is an action available for use. So player has that public method, which is direction. So we'll look for autocomplete set direction. <laughs> and we'll want to pass in action dot direction once again is a reference to action command so currently we've only got one property on that which is direction so we've created an instance of action command uh, with the JSON that we get past uh, the direction variable will get assigned uh, but we will also want to safeguard this so just in case we pass through something that doesn't have a direction variable um, in the JSON uh, we won't call it so we'll just do if not string dot is null or empty and then we're going to check so it fails somewhat gracefully <laughs> if direction doesn't get applied um, we can call action dot direction as long as that variable does live in action command um, but if it's empty we're not going to try and pass uh, an empty string to set direction and try and turn in an empty direction so there's safeguard number one um, that's pretty much all that we need from this end. So sort of a recap, we've made the connection, we've got a reference to the player in the scene, we've got a listener for the message, and when we get a message that has a direction as a part of the JSON, then we want to set it. Boom. Um, and that's where I defer to you, or let me to see if any of that made sense or if I'm moving too <laughs> quick or too slow. No, that made sense. I think I should have spent more time uh, on Postman showing what's actually being sent. Because I know I've just been like sending random uh, random requests with the endpoint uh, and my name, but I didn't actually show the data that was sent. And I think okay. I, I think like if you actually look at the JSON that's being sent, that would probably make more sense because you're actually so you, I, I see like you're accessing the like uh, direction um, direction variable in the JSON, etc. Uh, but yeah, so if you actually show yeah. what what's what's actually being sent, which I should have yeah. Done. So yeah. <laughs> And we can actually, we could go back to uh, sort of the collaborative approach, uh, which is if we share your screen. I don't, can we share, can we both be sharing screens? No, I'm not sure it's, how it's, the, it's okay. one, at a, one at a time. Gotcha. <laughs> Easy enough. Um, so, yeah, so you were inside of Postman and you were sending this. Um, these are very simple requests that are being sent. So the endpoint is an environment variable, excuse me, uh, that makes reference to that client ID. But the payload itself uh, is just a body of JSON. So depending on how complex the command that you're wanting to send across is, uh, that dictates how much JSON you're sending. So uh, user is a variable we will be sending and setting up. So the username is from that environment variable. So Postman allows you to use environment variables all throughout, whether it's you know in the request bar, 
uh, in the body itself, in the test that you may be wanting to perform on the response uh, of the request. Um, and then we're going to add in just the other things, which are we want to perform a particular action or turn a particular direction. But this body is raw, and it's JSON. Uh, so much like we were trying to uh, export the collection as raw JSON yeah. <laughs> from, from GitHub, uh, JSON can do a lot of things. Uh, for, for, for anyone who's not uh, you know, in development or not you know, very JavaScript or, or web-centric, you know, JSON is essentially uh, a string that also serves as a data structure that allows you to uh, nest data, um, and they make use of it uh, as we're doing in the game. Yeah, I think uh, it's I, very. I was oh, gonna. Go say, I think that helps with like understanding what you do better on the like scripting side, because uh, like actually now you know what you're trying to catch in like these different like action and direction. And yeah, yeah, it makes sense in my head, but you're right. It was kind of this like invisible <laughs> entity that's uh, <laughs> being sent from Postman. So yeah, it's just text. I mean, you're sending a JSON string. Uh, you're catching that JSON string uh, in the uh, controller or endpoint on the service, and then the service passes that in real time to the game. Uh, so we've got, uh, we'll focus on direction. So turn forward is just that. It's just uh, making use of a direction, turning forward. So now we want the postman not to do that because we've received it, we've passed it here, we're going to get that um, as direction. So at this point, it's no longer JSON, it's just stripped from the JSON, the direction we want to turn. Uh, so with that, uh, we can add in uh, the player control. So the first thing to do is I want to be able to apply this direction by name um, as simply as possible and in as few lines of code as possible. So what I set up here uh, was a dictionary. So a dictionary, um, also known as a hash map um, in many other languages, uh, is a way to apply a key um, to a variable and then get a value in return. So you can set up um, a system of, of uh, keys and values. So in this case, the key is going to be a string, float's going to be the value. Uh, we'll be able to uh, call uh, the value by the string name, which is going to be the direction we want to turn, and then it's going to pass back the float value. So I've already defined what the float should be um, for uh, the rotation of the character to be looking forward, back, left, or right. Once again, if if we went into the scene uh, on Unity, you know that's something that basically I had to take into respect uh, where he's yeah. looking to start and what we would consider, you know, forward, back, left, or right. So since he's starting facing the moon um, or planet or whatever you feel like that is, um, you know, he's starting at a negative 90 degree angle. So forward, back, left, and right are all uh, based on that. Uh, based on how much rotation would need to occur to go in those directions. So these, you don't call variables um, from their string name normally, but you can call variables from a dictionary or hash map by their string name. So I put it to do here. So the easiest thing to do would be to apply all four of these directions right now. So we'll call forward, which is what's going to get passed through. And then that uh, is going to apply to the forward variable, okay? And then we can just put a comma and do the next one. I'm gonna do some copy and pasting here yeah. to make this quick. <laughs> yeah, so we'll do. The best type of programming. <laughs> well, we're on a limited time frame here. I'm already thinking I might have left a little too much for us to do. <laughs> uh, we'll get there. Teamwork. You probably have one too many commas there, right? On the last line. Um, on the last line, good call. So that should do it. That's all we need from our dictionary to be able to get these variables by name. So for set direction, to be able to set the direction, we want to change uh, the rotation variable based on the direction that we've passed in. So we've got a float rotation that starts as forward and then will be applied to this straight off of the Unity documentation <laughs> uh, way to rotate the uh, the game object. So, so don't ask me about what all of these Euler angles and everything mean, but I do know that according to the documentation, if I apply the rotation uh, at this yeah. uh, as this argument, then that's going to allow me to uh, cause the transform to rotate uh, 
Actually, I think another thing that's good to show. So you, you talked about how uh, there's the the start like uh, function, and now you're you're on the update one, uh, and so the update one is kind of it, it's kind of like the Android programming, right? Like you've got this this one is called every frame, and whatever happens. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and I think the Android uh, is is actually uh, a a great comparison because it's that it's the game loop. It's it's the um, the the life cycle of the frames getting called. So there's actually different um, update methods that exist within Unity. There's standard update, there's late update, there's fixed update. Once again, if you're curious, go to the documentation. <laughs> it explains uh, sort of uh, with respect to the physics that are occurring in the scene at what point these updates get called. But it's just a continuous loop. You can actually, yeah, view the update method much like the uh, the application loop on an Android application. Um, the game loop is continuously called, and then that's the reason that things look like they're occurring in real time. Um, because if I call uh, rotation, um, then uh, it's going to rotate with respect to where it currently is, and then slowly rotate towards what the target is. So I've created a target, um, which is an angle compared to where I'm at, and then for each um, call of the game loop update method, uh, it's going to slowly rotate, rotate until it hits uh, that target. Yeah, I remember. So yeah, I used to do like uh, I think we talked about it before, like doing virtual reality stuff with Unity, and I've never done as much math as I had to do with Unity when like in my whole programming career, like doing all these like angle calculation and stuff was fun. Maybe I don't know how. To, yeah. I don't know how to put it. U Euler angles and <laughs> yeah. uh, slurping towards something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, it is. I mean, Unity at times, uh, especially if you're getting into you know creating like really smooth graphics, uh, it can require uh, some thought, like I said, uh, mathematically, as to how you apply it and get it there. But luckily, the documentation is really good. The community's huge. Um, so, and, and like I said earlier in the conversation, it's been around for so long that um, if you have a question and you Google it, there's probably someone who has yeah. uh, <laughs> some sort of answer. Uh, but beware, it's been around long enough that what what was a good answer maybe six years ago might not be a good answer in 2020. So make sure you're keeping respect to the version that you're getting the answer from. Uh, but yeah, so we want to apply uh, the rotation uh, direction based on what we've just passed in um, through our string. So in the JSON, we don't need to know from Postman what, uh, what the actual float would be um, to have that proper direction in the scene. We just know we want to look forward. So I had already set that forward in this case is negative 90, which I had shown you in the game scene is negative 90. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, that dictionary applies the string forward to the forward variable. So now we just need to say that rotation is directions, which is our dictionary direction. So we call that dictionary value by key and directions direction uh, this, the variable direction will be the string either forward, back, left, or right. And uh, rotation will be set to that. And on the next iteration of the game loop, it will create that angle and start slurping towards uh, that rotation. And it happens really quick in real time. Um, can't say for sure how many times the update loop would get called before it actually gets there. Um, and that's that. So we could actually test this out now because... Uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm turning to my right. I do have some notes on. <laughs> I've noticed. I didn't, I didn't want to let people know. I was like, no, no, it's it's fine. It's just like, oh, do we need? He knows. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, uh, I have a pretty good idea. I mean, I did write it, but uh, <laughs> I also have what's you know, I have source control, so I can look at the missing pieces of my code from source control, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah, so we've got that. We'll go ahead and save it. So at this point, we'll get our endpoint. We'll be able to apply that to Postman. And then we will pass in a direction, see if it's null or empty. If it's not, we'll set that direction to the rotation of directions based on that string value. Ta-da. So okay. let's go ahead let's and try. kick off the scene. Fingers crossed we don't get an error, which <laughs> we shouldn't. Okay, so we've got him over here. Um, and you know what? I'll actually kick it off for a minute. We'll go to maximize on play because I'm assuming on the shared screen you can hardly see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, so Thanks. here's the game. So at this point we can take 
what's in the endpoint bar. We can go to Postman. And this is going to be a little more annoying during development um, in that when you get a new connection, you have to apply that to the variable. Uh, in real time, it's a one-time thing because, uh, you know, the actual game, you would just launch, launch it once and then get that endpoint. Um, I know Danny, if he's uh, on the stream, he's not a fan of having to paste this in every time. So, uh, well, he and I will collaborate at some point to make this an easier process. Maybe actually create user accounts where you don't always have to copy it, but it just knows what user has what connection. We, we'll uh, get you a, a run in Postman button that auto-generates the collection with the right endpoint. That should be feasible. Yeah. A hundred percent. Anything's possible. It's just how much time do you want to spend doing it, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got the yeah. endpoint set. So we've got uh, the direction forward. We've got the game over here. So I'm not going to pass in the username yet. It wouldn't be a big deal if we did uh, because it's not trying to make use of it or anything. Um, but we will send the forward command and, well... He's already forward, so that doesn't make much sense. But we could try. So Danny, could com try Danny confirms he's not a fan. <laughs> okay, so he is there. That was more of a test <laughs> to see if Danny was listening. All right, so we'll do right. And then we'll do back. Ta-da. Hello. So we, we've got full rotation. We've got full branding. That's, that's basically where we always want to end this. We always want to end it with him facing to the back so we get our branding in there. Yeah, we'll use that as a, as a thumbnail when we post the video. Like a, a good old Postman uh, logo. Yeah. It, he, I mean, it's, it's a logo of himself, more or less. Did you pick this character because he was orange as well, or is it mostly for the post, Postman art? I mean, it, it actually fits like perfectly the brand. Yeah, so I, I actually adjusted uh, some of the different color levels. Um, Oh, someone's controlling him. I wonder who. <laughs> if, if that's if it's Danny doing it, that's wild because that he had to he copy the whole just, thing. Yeah, he had to copy this whole string. <laughs> on my I can I can see him doing that, but uh, I can. Uh, we always have people on the streams like we we've done that before where there was like same. It was like a, a UID that you had to copy, and before we had time to paste it in the chat, like people were like sending comments to it, so so you never know. But yeah, that's, that's like a... it's, it's so small. I can hardly see it at 125%. <laughs> so that's that's talent, whoever did that. Uh, we'll actually paste it in the chat whenever we get done so everybody can yeah. start going crazy with it. Um, yeah. I don't even know where we're at. Oh, the Postman. Yeah. we. So there's materials that get applied to um, a 3D model. Um, once again, not a modeler uh, by any means, but I sort of understand how they work in that a 3D model is more or less just like a series of vertices uh, to which a material can be applied. <laughs> Someone's still turning him. It's, um, it's not Danny, he says. So it's not? Someone. I don't know how many are even on the stream, but <laughs> kudos to you. Speak up if you want to be known. Actually, well, we will know because we're going to apply the user log here in a minute. Yeah. So maybe that's what we do next. Uh, but yeah, so basically I adjusted the materials to uh, have colors a little bit closer to the Postman branding. But as far as having a uh, ready-to-go 3D astronaut model, I just really lucked out that there was a free asset on Unity. Uh, and like I said, if, if you want to give that person any business or use it for yourself, it is on the GitHub repo. It's a, a company called Pulsar Bytes. They've got really quality uh, assets for sure. So, so there's their plug. Joyce, Joyce is asking for a link. But this one is not this one is not production ready yet. I can't, yeah, I can't so the link's gonna disappear in about three, two, one. Okay. So <laughs> since I killed that game instance, that link is no longer relevant. Um, but we'll make it relevant here in a minute when we it actually was, launch the finished product. John's work alias doing that. So John. <laughs> and it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, you just pasted the link for them to use. Uh, give us <laughs> give us five. We'll walk through uh, the whole uh, adding the the user log, like the username, and then we actually go back to the the production one, and we can all play with it. How does that sound? Good. Yeah. Uh, we also had text product that was just finished, like typing the here. Okay, let's do that. Let's do. Let's do cool. uh, username, and then go back to prod. Yeah, yeah. So we can do username, and we can do actually, if we. It how much time do we have left? 
Uh, we have like until uh twelve thirty your time. Wait, okay. I don't until half past your time. I don't know which time zone you are on. I yeah, always forget. It'll, it'll be it'll be two thirty. So you're okay. in London. You said what part of the UK are you in? You're you're in London, correct? Yeah, London. So it's it's eight for me now. Eight p.m. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> burning burning that midnight oil, or that eight o'clock oil, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, what we can do then, because I mean, we do have a little more time to kill, is we will go to production. Uh, but I think what's the most fun is not necessarily the direction, but actually applying the action. So the action is going to be walk, run, idle, and flip. flip. And to do that, I can quickly show how you can apply an animation to a character, and then how we can call that animation from code. Uh, a lot of the plumbing has already been explained, so we'll be able to get through it a little bit faster because you already know how we make the connection. You already know how we receive the JSON. So yeah. right here, we'll just apply that same thing. So in this case, we can start sending the action JSON. Um, so action dot... Dot action? Well, it'll be action dot perform. So okay. <laughs> they perform an action and then they do it in a particular direction. <laughs> Uh, to do that, we'll have to go back to the action command, apply another string. Uh, perform. So then, if we do action perform, then instead of dot set direction, we will do dot perform action. So once again, doing a little error handling. Is it no? <laughs> Oh. A, a good, good old like error catching, obviously like refer, resurfacing for the user that something went wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just just throw just an absolute ridiculous error. <laughs> nah, that doesn't doesn't really do a lot of error throwing at all. It either works or it doesn't. It, yeah. If it if it doesn't uh, uh, receive JSON that it can make use of, it doesn't error out. It just doesn't. So that's kind of the point. Is <laughs> it either. <laughs> Uh, it either works or it doesn't. The one sort of guarantee that I have is I do have this ping. So if you're curious as to whether the connection ID you've pasted in or not, uh, pasted in, um, is actually a live connection ID, then you can ping it and it'll say yes or no. Yeah, for, for V2, we can have uh, the actual postman not talking the arrows out and you can have like a bubble that goes out and says like console log, whatever the arrow <laughs> was. <laughs> That's actually really creative. I mean, I was just thinking a console log, but yeah, why not make the speech bubble the console? I like that. All right, we're getting you in. We're yeah. getting you in on this, and then we're getting the community in on this as well, because uh, I've got limited time to work on this type of stuff these days. Uh, all right, so to perform that action, we will start applying uh, some certain commands. Give me a second here. Okay. So in player control for perform action, uh, we're going to make use of a classic switch statement. So with the switch, we will switch on the action. And now we can create cases. So in the case of it being idle, we will do stuff and things. For the moment, we're just going to break it until I show you how we're actually going to apply these animations. Um, don't need a colon there. We need four different cases. So we'll have idle, walk, run, and flip. So idle, walk, run, and flip. So right now, nothing will happen. We can enter the action block. We can look at the case of what the string that we passed in is, so what the action is. Um, and then we're currently just breaking before we accidentally fall into the next case statement. Um, which is a good programming tip to anybody who's <laughs> using Kate State. Don't forget your break uh, because it will fall into the next block. Um, as far as how we're going to apply the animation, uh, we can go into the scene. So the Postmonaut uh, has a character controller attached to it and an animator attached to it. So the character controller uh, is actually how we're applying movement and rotation, but the animator is going to be how we apply animations that lucky for me came with the asset itself. So the asset has several different baked in animations, but that doesn't exactly dictate how those animations uh, get applied um, or when you transition in and out of that, in or out of that animation. So for that, we've got our animator window. Um, I can try and make this a little bit larger so everybody can see it. 
Nice. We can blow this up. Okay, so we've got our animator window. We'll zoom in a little bit. And this is fun. We're basically going to create sort of a state machine. So we'll add in a couple of parameters. So the animator allows you to uh, have parameters that are of different variable types. And then based on the value you give that parameter, you can transition to and from different states of animation. So we will apply two as bools. We'll do walk and we'll do run. Okay. Those are going to be false by default because we just want to sit idle by default. Idle. So within idle, uh, there's uh, nothing that even really has to be happening. It just needs to be a default state. So then within the layer, we're just going to make use of our base layer. We don't need to create any additional layers because this isn't complex animation, but we do need to create different states. So we'll create a state and we'll call it walk. Sadly, in this view, I can't see the toolbar that I need to change the state. And we'll come over here. We'll make it just big enough for everybody to see. Okay. So new state is now going to be called walk. Walk. <laughs> so walk is something uh, that can be transitioned to using that bool value, but it's also going to need to transition out of it. So um, as far as the motion that walk represents, we can click on that and it's going to give us the animations uh, that are available. So we will use walk. So we've got a state called walk with the motion of walk. How do we get to it? So from idle, we will make a transition to walk and then from walk, we will make a transition to idle. We're going to do this based on a condition. So we're going to uncheck has exit time and it's going to tell me, well, I either need a condition or an exit time. So this is going to go to walk if the bool walk is true. And then guess how we're going to get out of it? Well, we are going to transition to idle if the bool walk is false. And it's really that simple. So it's simple in that I have an asset with an animation. I've got a state that uses that animation. I transition to it when walk is true. Transition to it out of it when walk is false. Uh, and then we're just going to repeat that for run. So we're going to create another empty state. We're going to call this one run. We're going to apply run. We'll transition to it without an exit time. That when... seems, yeah, that seems super easy even, I feel like. I, I don't know if it didn't exist when I used to do Unity or if I didn't know about it, but that looks pretty cool. Yeah, it, uh, the animator is, is fascinating. Uh, creating animations, I mean, hats off to people who actually, you know, are capable of creating these models and, and believable animations because that's definitely outside of my realm. Um, but as far as Unity's ability to make use of those animations, yeah, the, the animator window uh, in, the, in the states that you're able to make use of, it makes it really easy. And, and we'll see here in a second um, how easily that can be applied uh, through code. It really doesn't take a lot of, of, of thinking from your end other than you know walk needs to be true or false and run needs to be true or false. You can even see that in creating this transition, it's created sort of a default um, logical path of how it can go from one animation to the next. I didn't really even have to think through that. I'm just going to take the defaults and we will go. Um, last but not least, for flip... So flip in my mind is not so much a state, right? So a state would be we're idle, we're walking, or we're running. But if we want to flip, we can do that in any state. We can flip while we're idle, and we can flip in any direction going at any speed. So we'll create another state, and we'll call it flip just so that we can have... Man, I can't flip. type today. <laughs> flip. Uh, yeah, so we'll apply the flip motion. Um, this is something we're just going to invoke by name and then we just need to transition out of it. And for that, we'll just use the default exit time. So basically, once it flips, it automatically transitions back to idle. So we'll call flip. It'll say, okay, use my exit time, and in the time it takes to finish performing that action, we'll transition back to idle. Boom. So we've got three different animations set up uh, and more or less a state machine built around it. So how do we apply that through code? Well. Very simply. So we'll move this window back to there. 
and we'll go in here. So I set up my switch statement. Um, what I need to make use of is the animator. So anim is a variable that I have at the top of the class. Uh, it is of type animator. And surprise, surprise, in my start method, when I'm setting up the scene, I need to get the component animator. Now, this may look a little bit different to anyone who is watching my service actions, because in here, I'm uh, finding a game object and getting its component. That's based on the fact that service action is just a standalone game object that needs to find other stuff in the scene and say, hey, do the stuff, do the things. Um, in this particular instance, we are uh, calling a component of the object that we already are on. So this script lives on the postman. It's right here, player control, boom. So that has a character controller and an animator already on the game object itself. Um, so I just need uh, that particular component of the game object, which is the animator. Okay. So anim is what I'm able to make use of. Um, within that, anim has several methods available to it. But since I showed you how we are setting up the different bool states, ta-da, set bool. We'll make use of that. And then we'll just call it by name. So if I'm idle, I don't want walk to be true. So we'll set false. Nor do I want run to be true because... If I'm idle, I'm not doing either of those things. Um, in the case of walking and running, we can basically just copy this over and set them either to true or false. So if I'm walking, let's first set run to false and then walk to true. And then if I'm running, let's set walk to false and then run to true. Last but not least for flip, I don't need to change any of the states but I do want the animator to play. So when you when you come out of flip, you said you go straight to idle. So it means if I was walking and then I do a flip, it will end the walk animation and it will revert to idle. So, no. So yes and no. So that's kind of the, the glory of our state machine is that when you flip, it transitions to idle, but idle will transition to or from walk based on what bools are set. So... If I flip and then transition to idle, it will immediately transition out of idle to either walk okay. or run if walk or run is still set to true or false. So if I never set walk or run to false, then once it flips, it says idle, but it doesn't sit in idle for long because it's going to choose which direction to go based on what bulls are alive. If both of these are false, it just stays idle. Okay, that makes sense. And it's actually pretty cool if you watch it in real time. If we leave the animator open and we don't maximize the game, uh, you can actually watch the animator in real time get invoked through the script, call a transition, and then make a decision on which direction to go. Uh, so as far as debugging goes, um, that's a pretty good... We, we don't have to do that today, but that's a pretty good tip, too, if you're curious why it is or is not doing what you want it to do. Um, watch the animator. Watch it in real time. See what it's doing. And, and that's what's cool about Unity, too, is that if you're in a scene and you don't maximize um, the, the game itself, you can manipulate the scene in real time while you're playing the game to see if certain things you do in the scene have an effect on the game itself. So, uh, you know, it's, okay. it's a level of debugging, but it's more physical debugging, uh, but it works well. So once we play that, uh, we don't have to do anything else because our state machine handles the rest. The last thing to do would be to set the speed variable based on whether it's idle, walk, or run. So uh, we do have um, speed being referenced. So we have movement, rotation, speed. Speed uh, is going to be um, depending on what transform forward is. So depending on our rotation, we'll consider forward the direction that they're facing, which is the forward facing point of the transform transform being the the character itself um, then we apply a speed to it so on each game loop we'll apply that movement based on the current speed so we just need to change that speed variable based on what we're doing so if we're idle speed equals take a guess or only zero Boom. <laughs> that was a, you actually caught me off guard there and i was like oh but... <laughs> <laughs> negative negative one so jo uh, John is saying Chuck Norris would just go from flip to run. That is true. I don't know. Or we, he would just like flip once and revolve around the, the earth. 
once. Probably. I was gonna say I don't, I don't I don't think that would happen. I think yeah, he would just continue to flip. I mean, once <laughs> the flip started, it would just never end. Just flip through the world, and flip through his enemies. <laughs> uh, that's what we should we should create the postman not Chuck Norris edition. <laughs> Uh, real quick, we'll just apply speed as walk speed and run speed for these other two. So speed equals run speed, and we're good there. And if you're curious what these are, these are set at the top of the class. So if you're in a class, you can see that some are public and some are private. Um, encapsulation is you know, a concept used in programming in C Sharp that kind of controls what access you have to variables. Um, but that said, in Unity, public and private is pretty simple. If it's public, you can see it in the editor. If it's private, you can't. So I can set default values for these so that anyone who pulls down the game will have uh, you know variables set by default. Uh, but if I actually go to the player in the game and look at player control, you can see these are all of my public variables. So it's really cool the way that Unity uh, applies those variables to the editor that you could change right here. So without even changing it in the script, if I'm working on the game and I feel like I need to adjust these variables, um, to go a little bit faster, go a little bit smoother, go a little bit slower. Uh, you can do it right from here. So these are all the public variables from that class. Um, that's a, that's another then, idea for V2, where you can initiate your own game with these variables as you want as you want them. Like you can change the gravity, you can change the oh, yeah. default speed. Uh, yeah, that's I'm, I'm writing them down, and we we'll get to we'll get to them at some point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hopefully hopefully there's a, a time and a demand for it. But yeah, anyone who pulls it down, um, yeah, I mean, the simplest change, run speed, if you change that from 10 to 15, is going to be night and day in this instance. Uh, you can see walk is 3, run is 10, so yeah. imagine what like 15 or 20 would be. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. We've got those, I already defined those, uh, so I can apply the speed based on what those are, based on what the state is. So now uh, we have everything we need uh, to perform an action. Um, so we will do that and then, uh, we will get to the public, uh, usage of the game real quick. So let's just make sure that works. So if I want to maximize it and launch it. Okay. So we'll go to Postman, apply that variable. And we will do something that requires an action like walk. So chat, don't, don't need to like copy this URL. It's going to change soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, slow down. Uh, we'll, we'll run through the log part real fast so that we have time for everyone to play it. Uh, but you can see he's walking. So at this point, walk is a single performance, but we can also do a performance and a direction. So if we want to walk forward, well, we're already doing that. But what if we want to walk backwards? Well, we'll send that. And he turns around and he walks. So... We've got that working. So we've got our actions and our directions. Last but not least would be to apply the log so that when we're in real time with other people playing, we know who did what and not mystery guy from the chat making my guy go different <laughs> directions, but we're like, who did it? So uh, we'll apply that real fast. So the last thing to do would be to add an action command uh, property for the user. Okay. Uh, actions log is what we're gonna make use of. So within the UI on the canvas, I've got the endpoint bar. Um, I need to create um, a UI text. Uh, with that, I've already got a prefab. Uh, so within Unity, um, prefabs are more or less game objects that have been created and can be reused throughout scenes, or in this case, applied to a scene that it's missing from. So actions log uh, is now applied to my canvas, which is anything that appears on the UI and not so much in the game. Uh, actions log will have the script attached to it and it will have a text component. So in the same uh, way that we're finding the UI input for the input bar uh, or, or the endpoint bar and then creating that reference and applying the text, we're going to do that for the actions log real quick. Um, and I'm only sort of speeding through this because we're running out of time. <laughs> so good. I'm getting hungry, but it's I can handle it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. All right. So what we're going to do... Give me one second here. Too many windows open, and I need to get to this script. 
the actions log. Okay, so we'll create a reference to the text object I just pointed out. We'll call it UI text. And then since the script is on the same object as the component, we can just do UI text equals get component text. And then we're going to write out what we would like to see on the scene. Uh, so UI text dot text. So it is a text box, but it also has a text property, which is dot text. And going to plus equal, which means we're not going to truncate any of the existing text, but we are going to add more to it. Um, and we can do that through a stream template, which is user. is action dot user so and you're not creating this like three lines of who's the user what's the action and i'm calling this from service actions so uh in the same way uh, that we're taking uh, the json and calling the methods from uh, the uh, player object um, we're also uh, creating a reference uh, to the actions log. And instead of just passing a particular piece of the JSON, like whether I want to perform it or whether I want to go direction, I'll pass in the entire JSON because I need all three pieces of it. Yeah. So that's also necessary, uh, which is within service actions. We just need to make a quick reference to what we're using, which is equals... log and we're getting the component from it which is actions log okay. so we've got our variable we've created a reference to it and then right here we're going to call actions log dot entry and then just pass in all of the JSON, the whole which thing, in this yeah. and then here, like you said, we're gonna just make three lines user um, and direction, and we'll do action dot action dot direction, and we don't need a plus at the end because we're done, but we do need of these so backslash in mm -hmm. uh, it's just a representation of end line so that ends the line goes to the next and the line goes to the next and then this ends it twice so that the next entry has two spaces um, and that more or less should be what we need to get that done I don't think I have any other to do's we added those we added those we added those uh, player control we added those uh, actions command has user direction perform and then we didn't touch endpoint bar or camera follow. So from here, we'll do one last local launch, make sure that we can do it, and then we'll switch over to the public one, and we've got a few minutes to play around on that. So if I go to Postman, which I have collapsed very small. Yeah, I was talking yeah. earlier about how if you're like in a very small window, Postman becomes not unusable, but you have to scroll a lot to get like access to the actions you want to take. So there's, yeah. a, there's a minimum required. Or using and I think it's mentioning that uh, to make this viewable to everybody else, I've got my screen yeah. <laughs> at like 50% of what it would normally be. So I usually work on a little bit uh, with a little bit more real estate. Uh, so at this point, let's do, we pasted that in. So let's walk left. Okay. So he's walking left and you can see that the user, Evan Lindsay, performed walk and in the direction of left. Um, nice. That's it. We've got a game. We added in our <laughs> animations, we added in our actions log, and then slowly but surely we added in the missing pieces of code. Um, and I kind of tried to highlight on, uh, you know, why these are being applied and sort of, of, of how these can all live together. Uh, but yeah, if you want to switch back over to your screen, Arlami, we can uh, okay. launch it on the web and then everybody can start sending their actions in if they'd like. Let's do that. Uh, let me start sharing on Skype. And switch here. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen. So I still have, I it didn't move from before. I have Postman with the collection created. 
So now what we're going to do, we're going to go back to the one of that here. Um, <laughs> Major Tom has been doing things apparently. Okay, so uh, anyone that has joined since, uh, the first thing you need to do, and I'm going to paste that in chat, is go to uh, go to that URL and grab the Postman collection, which is here. So you can click here and then row. And you can take this URL and import it to Postman uh, or any other like, tool that you may use to call APIs. And then you can do link, paste it, and import. So I'm not going to do it because I already have it. The other thing is I will share the endpoint of this one. Paste it in chat as well. The second link that I've sent is the endpoint. And what you have to do is either you can replace it directly in each call that you want to do, or you create a new environment like we've done before and replace it here. So I already have the right one. Uh, yeah, I do. I'm really going to use that one. Uh, and from there on, uh, I'll put my postman on the side. Not Danny, he's already playing along. Let me, I need to, I need to join as well. Let me, let me do my thing. I'm trying to get in there before. Before it's too late. We have the real Chuck Norris. Oh, some people are definitely using the collection runner there. It goes way too fast. <laughs> you put that full screen. Oh, okay, I got a left in. Are we going to break Heroku, you think? <laughs> no, I think uh, I think they can scale out to at least this chat. <laughs> Maybe at some point I'll have to pay for a... Uh, a better a better tier but uh for now we'll go with the free one uh, i think we oh uh, yeah see we reached out the the limit on the left but someone already decided to turn so we have so i'm guessing if you get no as the user is because it's not been filled in right uh no i think if if we if you don't pass any user it just won't uh it will try so i think i think someone's explicitly passing in null okay. let me let me try, let me try it uh what am i going to do i'm just building my own thing on the the collection right on the side. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. So that's me performing, right? There's no user. Okay. So someone, okay. someone typed in null as their username. <laughs> All right. I've got. I've got mine set up. You're not ready. <laughs> oh, you're using the collection runner. Yeah, it just went crazy. That's pretty good. I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> yeah, tester's gonna test. <laughs> tester's gonna test. <laughs> and test is for our send, send the value as new. Yeah, I was actually, uh, the first time you actually uh, showed the code, uh, you, you hadn't mentioned the dictionary yet. And I was like, can I try to send like random random uh, strings and we did perform like all the things but then you actually went into the dictionary and I was like okay I guess there is some sort of like uh, boundaries as to what you can send yeah <laughs> yeah so it uh yeah I, I mean if it tries to uh I, I guess yeah if at this point if you do um send an action if you send a perform uh key in the json so user perform direction if you perform uh something that isn't accounted for uh, in the dictionary, yeah, it just throws an internal error yeah. in that it can't find that it can't find that key, um, which I should probably safeguard for as well. Uh, <laughs> so let's if see. it's not one of these things. We have uh, Javier, we have Rita from Belgium, we have Danny, Danny who's saying, screaming out for a gamepad. Uh, actually, so we were talking about that before starting the stream, and there's quite a few things that have changed uh, in the in the code, but let's see. Um, is it available directly? So what Danny has done is created a, is used the visualizer to to create a, just a gamepad that you can use to play the game. Oh, who's doing that? The real Chuck Norris is flipping everywhere. Uh, as, he, as he should, as he should. <laughs> uh, so let me see if it's published. And not, I'll go here, templates, who's it be, boss, man out. No. Okay, I'll see if I can find. So I'll I'll leave that up for you to play with, and I'm going to 
look for on our internal slack if I can find it because that was cool mm -mm -mm. yeah Danny if you're out there can you send the link oh if you have the link Danny and you can send it in chat then we can we can try as well uh, So what he's looking for is is uh, the code for a visualizer. So a visualizer is something that lives in Postman where you can send a request and basically get back um, a visual uh, as described by the response. Um, and then you can use that visual to do different things. So in this case, Danny actually created a visual, uh, a visualizer of a gamepad. Uh, of course, it's, it's a gamepad he found on CodePen. Uh, yeah. But he was able to apply the different requests to the different uh, to the different elements of the gamepad and use it uh, to send requests across to the service. So, uh, so I really couldn't cool. find the I couldn't find the collection, but I found the video, uh, which is this one. So that's the V 0.1 of the game, and that was uh, Danny did with the with the visualizer. So you've got your controller, and you can click on the different elements and do do the actions. Uh, but we won't be able to to do it right now. Uh, though, if Danny actually sends the collection at some point, I'll add it to the to the YouTube video descriptions, and you can play around with it uh, later. Uh, so before we leave, that's very cool, and I'm very happy that you were able to play with it. Uh, I'm going to do my collection runner one more time because I really liked it. So I'm not signed into Twitch, or Lemmy. Yeah. Um, so I can't respond to the chat, uh, but someone just asked, Jettison just asked if uh, we can recommend any resources for Unity noobs. Yeah. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, if you go to learn.unity.com, uh, you can pull that up for them. We're just giving Unity all kinds of PR on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yep. Yeah, Uni Unity Learn is, is where I would start. So outside of the fact that the forums or, you know, whether it's Stack Overflow, Unity Zone forums, uh, or just whatever else you find on Google, uh, you know, that's stacked full of information that you can search. But Unity Learn uh, is their own built-in system um, that I've done a couple of things on. Most of what I learned in Unity was far before, far before any of this was available. Um, but there's there's great great resources, great courses, great tutorials, um, and I believe during COVID uh, that a lot of this is actually free for people to make use of. So it's a, it's worth checking out uh, if you're new to Unity and you just aren't sure where to start. So actually, while you were saying that, I was sending things to. Is there a, a max number of uh, items you can get in your UI text element? Um, so it's just an infinite scroll. I mean, it's basically, it never overflows. So it's going to create the new entries at the bottom and then just push the other entries, uh, up. Um, so, I mean, however many will fit on the screen, uh, <laughs> are what will, are, or what, you know, you will see at the moment. And then as you saw in the code, the template only accounts for user perform and direction. Yeah. Okay. So really cool. And I'm happy we're able to play with that. Uh, thanks, Evan, for showing us all this. Uh, one thing we do before uh, leaving, it's the community shoutouts. Uh, so do you have any one that you want to give a shout out for apart from Unity, whether it be in the Postman community, it be in the gaming community, uh, anything that you want to put out there? Um, yeah, I didn't know I'd get a chance. So I didn't <laughs> much make a list. Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a professional uh, game developer by any means. It's just something I've played with for, for years, so I'm really not in the game development community. Um, if you check out my GitHub, which is where this is available, you know, github.com slash Evan Lindsay, um, I've got some fun side projects, uh, but most of what I'm focused on these days is uh, Postman itself. Um, so... We've already shouted out Danny, but shout out to Danny for creating the visualizer and, and uh, helping sort of support this, uh, going from a demo to uh, an even bigger demo. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, uh, you know, on that on that repo, uh, like I said, the the assets for the most part were provided by the publisher Pulsar Bytes. So uh, if you need free Unity assets, that's someone who uh, does a good job. Um, but yeah, outside of that. Uh, you know, also shout out to Arlemi for being the, the, the best developer <laughs> advocate that I've had a chance of working with. 
Oh, that's 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 not a, that's an easy one. I'm the I'm the only developer advocate at IBM. Uh, at IBM. Uh, uh, <laughs> at post one. Details. Details. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have Jettison, which is actually uh, the other developer advocate on the team, <laughs> who says no math. Uh, good question. She's asking about the resources for Unity noobs. Does it does it require math or knowledge or or not? So I, you know, I think Unity as a whole has made some effort to uh, allow uh, visual scripting tools to be available. Um, you know, for people who maybe aren't C sharp coders uh, or in that realm, I'm not as familiar with them because I haven't had a chance to use them. Uh, but it's worth searching, uh, like Unity visual scripting. Um, I'd say in in a lot of areas of programming math isn't necessarily uh the core of what you're working with unless you're getting to very low level functions uh you know something like uh, unity is you know a series of libraries and a framework as a whole that allows you to use really high level functions that have already done most of this work for you um so as a whole i mean no it's it's pretty uh, uh beginner friendly i would say and then danny says he sent his um controller through slack but i don't think we'll have time to look at it but i'm sure i will include it to the uh youtube video i'm sorry danny please put on me <laughs> i'll uh, i'll add it to the repo <laughs> as well it needs to be a part of the repo so i'll uh, i'll get it in there and then we have a uh, test pro that says thanks even so in terms of shout out uh there's one thing that we had discussed actually like a while ago on uh, on slack when we we're talking about gaming so if gaming is something that you're interested in in terms of like uh, retro gaming uh, there's a link that uh, even i shared with me which is uh, honor on nrw gaming which is a, a youtube channel that just does like uh, reviews is it reviews of old games that they do so it's playthroughs yeah playthroughs. So, so it's it's new retro wave which uh, if you're a programmer you might be uh, familiar with it's just kind of fun electronic sort of ambient music um well, it just depends on what, which one you click on. But uh, with their gaming stream, uh, yeah, or their gaming channel, it's playthroughs of old video games uh, with new retro way music layered on top of it. So uh, very nostalgic and pretty good background <laughs> noise. And and the one that I shared is uh, my abandonware, which is like resources of old games that uh, you can't really like you can't buy, you can't find anywhere, and it's just a resources of like. For example, the first Rayman Arena, which was like released in 2001. So you can actually uh, either play them directly in the browser or download them and play them, uh, which is very cool. Again, it's very, I don't know if it's just us two being very nostalgic of like old like gaming experience or any, whether anyone else is going to be interested in it. But yeah, that, that would be my, uh, my, my shout outs uh, for, the, for the gaming side. For the Postman side, I'm going to have a quick look. Uh, as always, if you're in the community forum, there's a community showcase uh, where you can see uh, what people have created. Uh, there's plenty of stuff out there, actually. Uh, this one, which is, where's my Tesla? Creating a data API using Kafka, Rockset, and Postman to find out. So if you have a Tesla and you want to use Postman to find where it is, uh, I'd recommend uh, checking that one out. So uh, Nadine has created that. And there's a blog uh, post on their platform that you can go and check out. Um, with that said, let me go back to the talking slide and let me see if there's any leftover messages. Uh, oh, John shared a link as well to software library of MS-DOS games uh, that you can check out. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and Shivam says, we cool. Thank you. Thank you, Shivam. Um, so with all that said, I think we, we, we did uh, everything that we were meant to do, apart from unfortunately uh, showing the showing the control that Danny did, uh, but we'll make sure that we have a, a shout out for it in the, in the YouTube video later. And uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Evan. Uh, have yeah, a good day. Thanks for having me. And you know, thanks for everybody that showed up or maybe watching this in the future. Uh, yeah. And bye bye, everyone. Have a good day, have a good evening, uh, and see you on the next stream. Bye-bye.